Welcome back. Uh, my name is Jim Crompton, uh, Professor of Practice in the Petroleum Engineering Department at Colorado School of Mines in Golden, Colorado in the United States. And I'm uh, pr uh, putting together this uh, four-part uh, kind of recorded lecture series on the Digital Oil Field 2.0. And um, I'm reaching out to the uh, audience and SBE uh, student section at the Pandit Dean Dayal Petroleum University in India. It's a great honor for me to uh, have this opportunity. And I, I wish it was a little bit more, uh, you know, in person, face to face. Uh, uh, it's hard to just, you know, sit here and give a lecture to a camera on my PC. But anyway, I'm going to do the best I can. And I hope that it's. Uh, uh, provides interesting kind of context and uh, a little bit of more information for you as uh, we really are talking about how automation, uh, sensors, a lot of new digital technology, you know, are, are working into the how we uh, produce oil and gas. And on this one, you know, this is kind of the last of the four sections. I want to talk a little bit more about how a lot of the analytics is moving to the edge, the edge meaning the, the, the oil producing facility, or essentially the, the drilling rig, or the uh, you know the the well the wellhead itself, and a little bit here I'm going to kind of finish up. And everyone talks about how incredible the opportunity is for artificial intelligence, machine learning, statistics, data analytics, data science, whatever you want to call it. And indeed, that promise is significant. But there are some things to watch out for, and I want to leave you with just a few cautions as we finish up this uh, fourth lecture. Well, the whole idea of automation and digitalization, you know, some people feel, you know, quite comfortable with it and others, you know, get, get a little anxious, you know, and, and you know, kind of there's a lot of cartoons and stuff being, uh, you know, produced about uh, how all of this is happening. But, you know, it's, it's actually a bit true that about, uh, except for the takeoff and landing, an awful lot of the, uh, of the flying that we do, uh, you know, when we, uh, you know, take long journeys, et cetera, is actually done by an autopilot. It's a, a, a automation essentially is in flying our planes. The human is there in case of uh, kind of emergencies. And again, I said for the takeoff and landing, but um, maybe we get to the point where the human doesn't need to be there at all. What would you think of that? Well, let's put our eyes back on the oil field and let's, you know, take a look at, uh, you know, maybe a modern uh, well pad with a, uh, with a number of uh, wells, you know, uh, this one is just kind of a four pad unit. Um, and it's not normally manned. I mean, after we the drilling and completion activities are all done, and we essentially, you know, the, the trailers for the human beings are, are kind of, uh, you know, taken back to or moved to another location. And this, this sort of facility will kind of run by itself. Maybe a human being will drive by every two or three days and check on some things, do some recordings or whatever it is. But think of this as a factory that could be automated. Think of this as a, as a kind of a factory that you might even apply the concepts of autonomous operations to, or, or not normally manned, as we've talked about some offshore facilities have been. What could happen if that was the situation? Well, this whole idea of operational technology and information technology converging, you know, it really has to go through a maturity curve. It, it doesn't all happen at once. And in generation one, you know, this uh, integration, if you will, really was all the, the automation, the plan automation was really just about keeping it running. You know, the, the data in, data out, uh, trend, you know, really produced trends of performance. And really there were just technology like process books to record a lot of the information. We had plan affirmation centers, Clearly, there were rooms where the, the controllers uh, kind of operated from. But, you know, if you look at in refining, that's probably 20 years ago. If you look at the oil field, you know, you may see some uh, of this first generation maturity operations still in existence. Well, it moves on and, and it matures. And generation two brought a lot more of the information about the plant or, or, or the, the oil field, if you will. And you really began to create uh, an entire view, a digital view of what was going on here. It's an asset framework. And you were able to do not only just recording of the performance of, of certain pieces of equipment, but, you know, begin to do analytics around maintenance, around, uh, 
you know, a event detection around upsets or whatever you will, if you go around them. And you begin to design workflows. I mean, they might've been very customized to the particular plant and equipment uh, that you're using, but we may even take, you know, from all of that, the plant operation center and remove it to a remote location, maybe a corporate uh, center or a regional hub, if you will. And now all of a sudden the experts uh, are, have their surveillance and monitoring capabilities from afar. And with all of this, you know, you were, we're beginning to take the data that we're recording through the sensors and control systems, et cetera, and be able to, to do a lot more uh, of, of the an analytics about how to, uh, the, the processes are really running and how we can improve them. So we have specialized advanced algorithms and models, the so-called digital twin that kind of grows up in this generation. Well, in generation three, the digital twin is quite mature. And it has a major role in kind of interacting with the physical operations. And there's a lot of, you know, kind of information and controls and alarms that are actually handled automatically. That they need to be handled for safety purposes or environment, product quality, whatever, you know, even faster than the human being, uh, you know, can make the decision. So, you know, things are automated, you know, even past that. Uh, and we begin to try to use the digital twin and our, our algorithms to predict what's going to happen, not just understand what is happening as you go through that. And when you get to it, you get to this idea of autonomous operation where it kind of runs based on the constraints of the, the physics and the, and, the, and the plan that was set up, but it kind of runs on its own and it adapts to different changes, not just static situations. Well, there's already kind of a, an architecture that's well designed for all of this. It kind of grew up in manufacturing rather than in the oil field. But we're now trying to uh, this place of, of deploying this sort of architecture, this, this framework that's been described as ISA 95, and describe this framework and kind of change it to and adapt it to the oil field. So here you've got from machines to the control systems to a manufacturing execution system, and even then to our financials and procurement sort of systems, and all of these becoming more and more integrated. Uh, again, not a new concept if you're in manufacturing, but a, a maturing and evolving one in the oil field. Well, that very first uh, layer, the machines and the sensors, this is a place where obviously uh, the whole area of what we can measure is exploding. It isn't just pressure and temperature anymore. Uh, just even if you look at your smartphone, it is an incredibly sophisticated sensor package. I mean, nobody uses it to make phone calls anymore, do they? But essentially, you've got a GPS unit, Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, all different kinds of connectivity. Uh, you know, you can have uh, accelerometers, you have a camera, uh, you know, light sensors, proximity sensors, uh, a magnetometer, gyroscope, all these different things are all in, in your hand with, you, with your smartphone. And if we can do that, just think what we're putting on our smart equipment as you go through that and how connected we can be, you know, through the new uh, telecommunication solutions. Well, if you think of this for a minute, think of our, you know, probably one of the more, you know, traditional pieces of equipment in the field, and that being the wellhead. Well, it, it is a big piece of metal, and there's an awful lot of valves and, and different sort of uh, chokes and things that are on this in order to prevent a blowout uh, for a control sort of scenario in case something, you know, really bad happens down hole. But we could take this major piece of physical equipment, this lots of steel that's, that's sitting on top of the well, and we can approximate it with an awful lot of digital information. So if I, if I put pressure and temperature sensors, flow meters, and different things on this piece of equipment, I can create a mathematical model of this physical thing. And with that, you know, I could do lots of, not only my remote monitoring and, and kind of safety sort of situations around that, I could really all then create a, a virtual you know, flow meter system without the, all the time and expense it takes for us to run our, our traditional uh, you know, well test, now all of a sudden I may be able to get one you know, as just often as I'd like, but it comes from the digital systems. Now, of course, we have to have a feedback unit when we do take a physical well test to calibrate and to uh, kind of update and verify what our, our mathematical flow metering system might look like. But we can create a digital model, even from something you know, as basic and as fundamental as a wellhead. Well, this convergence of operations technology to the information technology system 
you know, really kind of goes again, you know, I, I showed the ISA 95 before building it up as a pyramid, but this is just gonna be another way of looking at that. So all of a sudden there's data generation by the many sensors that we have on things, the, the, the physical pieces of equipment, you know, from meters, gauges, valves, pumps, uh, you know, uh, whatever it is that, you know, that makes up our, our field units. And then all of those things are, are you know, sensed by this, the, the information packages and our data is collected and aggregated in different sort of uh, solutions. And then here's the edge. Here's this area of most uh, important integration and convergence with the edge IT units. And finally, they connect to the data centers and the, through the cloud. And, and we have the data just about anywhere we want it. As much as we are working on the integration, there are other advances that are actually uh, adding more sensors to our, our unit. And here, you know, all of a sudden for field surveillance, we have a drone and there's uh, both in aerial drones and, uh, and subsea drones that can begin to be another pair of eyes, an extended, you know, sensing package, which, you know, often can go where it might be a bit dangerous for humans to go. And we can fly it around and gather information. And this is a, just a, a visual pair of eyes. You know, we can put different sensors on the on the drones and we can be chemical sensors. We can, um, you know, kind of sense in the infrared domain. And, and all of a sudden we, we have a very, very um, complex and performant sensor package, just like that smartphone is on your phone. We can put all of those things in a drone and then they're all of a sudden it's quite mobile. Well, we begin to connect all this stuff up. And here is just one example of an onshore pipeline SCADA environment. And all of a sudden, we're not just looking at one particular pumping unit, if you will, or, or gauging unit or metering system, but we can look at the entire system and this could go for hundreds of kilometers. So with this, you know, every once in a while, we, we need to, you know, aggregate that data and we, you know, through cloud technology, pump it to, uh, you know, be a satellite or, or wireless system or whatever. And now all of a sudden we have an entire system control, uh, control environment. And with that, with all of that data we're collecting, the analytics, the modeling, the trending, the alarming, all of those things that go with it. And again, this remote center could be, you know, in the middle of the basin where there's, you know, thousands of kilometers of pipeline that we're trying to control things through. So again, the digital uh, information allows us to build a view what through the integration of OT and IT and, and of these other digital technologies, it allows us to build an, an, an integration of an entire uh, basin-wide sort of system. Well, with all of this stuff, the, the tools that we have and are, you know, there are physical tools obviously, but the digital applications are growing up as well and they're getting more capable and people are adding more and more functionality to different layers of this thing. And here's just an example of uh, uh, an historian, uh, the Pi historian from OSIsoft, really is, is grown up from just our the, their traditional uh, historian, which is collecting a lot of tag data, time series data from a, different interfaces and connectors. And all of a sudden we can build up the framework, the context, uh, context around it. We can build up analytics and visualizations around it. We can catch particular events that go into our predictive maintenance sort of things. And then the notification is the alarms where you know we can uh, let human beings know that there's something that they should pay attention to. And with this, an awful lot of integration. This is kind of this idea of something that you, you know, formerly lived kind of in isolation in the OT world, now has a lot of connectivity to a number of uh, very important IT applications. Another way of emphasizing the same point of bringing all of this stuff together, uh, you know, we, from the, uh, the, the all of the sensors at the bottom of this slide, from all kinds of different, uh, you know, pieces of equipment, or maybe even, uh, you know, the, the pipeline systems, uh, trucks and cars moving around. Uh, and we can pretty much sense the entire environment. And then we can aggregate that data. We can integrate that data through some sort of middleware sort of infrastructure. We can use the public, um, you know, telecommunication, the cloud vendors, and essentially we can take this data anywhere you want it to go. Well, the next slide kind of shows us again, this idea that when we gather all of this information from all of these different sources, we can really begin to um, 
to put together and integrate the digitally here, the domain knowledge, the math and statistical knowledge, and, our, and all of our knowledge of the data. And we can go from the what has happened, why did it happen kind of surveillance and monitoring of our traditional systems into this predictive kind of mode to try to understand what is likely to happen. And then when we get a really good handle on that and our digital twin is constantly running in an optimization sort of mode, how can we make our processes happen at a better outcome than they currently do? Well, so here's the big world of analytics. And this is where an awful lot of this has exploded. And again, just an example, again, from this Pi asset analytics, but there are many tools and I'm not just trying to focus on on one, but this is the one where I've got some really good examples from. So essentially we began this descriptive, you know, with the basic part is this descriptive analytics. You know, what is happening? Can we configure calculations for transparency and scale. We can bring in math and statistical and time-based functions. We can integrate it with kind of uh, existing, uh, you know, analytical tools and simu where simulation and models live and, and make it easier for us to build these calculations from. And it has a lot to do with testing, and gets into our idea of operationalizing a predictive analytics model. And obviously clearly condition-based, state-based notification. This is where you know, alarms you know, are a very important piece of this to let us know when an anomalous situation happens. But all of this building kind of a platform so we can begin that idea of predictive forecasting simulations, whatever you want to call it. Well, when we get into the diagnostic, we really want to understand you know, what, what is happening, the trending, and we'll, we'll take data. This is probably one of the more basic things that we've been doing for a while on time series data, as we can essentially just run a little snapshot of the history. And we can look back and we can figure out, you know, how well this thing's been behaving, you know, how else it, maybe you've done a, a turnaround or you've changed some uh, some things on the equipment, how has it recovered? Uh, you know, is there is there beginning of, uh, of trending towards poor performance and that we need to uh, know when to intersect to, uh, to make some changes again or change out some physical pieces of the equipment? But from all of this data and all of this trends and, and recognizing when there are bad events that are going to happen, we can essentially forecast that and move that into the future to try to, you know, again, recognize all this. But clearly in this, to, to do predictive maintenance and, and run to failure analysis, we need to have captured a bad event, a you know, piece of equipment breaking. With that, we can then go backwards in time and recognize the precursor of that event. And the next time that precursor happens, we can move in and we can intervene before some sort of catastrophic failure happens. Well, in these analytics, um, sometimes the patterns we are looking for are, are a little bit different than linear regression sort of analysis. And here, you get again, from a rod pump, the Dynacard sort of signature that we get from uh, you know, those sort of uh, the pieces of equipment, essentially we can recognize what is a good pattern. And that's when everything is operating, the pump is operating, we're moving liquids up the hole. And, and then, but there are other sorts of patterns. So we build up a catalog of all of these different circumstances. And that way, you know, by matching our catalog with the observed uh, kind of pattern, we can recognize if things are going well, or, or we can use them as an early detection for corrective and preventative measures. Kind of the sky's the limit. Uh, what we can do with these analytics, you know, all of a sudden we, we have a whole lot of data. We may not understand the physics. We can't really, you know, put in an equation for the, uh, for the process that we're trying to understand. But we can build a mathematical model of what that process, process is through our machine learning sort of technologies and, and, and capabilities. And that way, you know, kind of the real-time analytics for the equipment and operation is providing a significant bottom line value, not, more than just surveillance and monitoring, but now getting into this idea of prediction and simulations. And with this and forecasting the future and recognizing precursors of events, we don't have to run to failure. We can, you know, get in there and we can tune things or we can make changes or we could do uh, maintenance, you know, sort of things that it's uh, before the, the, the effort. And this way, you know, we just even on maintenance sort of things, we can save a great deal of time and money by doing the maintenance at the right time and not, you know, too soon and not too, uh, too late. Uh, 
And essentially, we can be on this condition-based maintenance will really lower operating costs and uh, the times when the, the, a piece of equipment breaks and all of a sudden production completely stops until we repair it. Well, there's lots of new technology, even startup companies that are coming in and are working very hard at this idea of time series analytics. And you know, with this, clearly this gets at our idea of our big data velocity problem. And we were gathering a whole lot of data and it's coming at us at a, at a sample rate that could be one hertz, it could be a hundred hertz. Uh, so we have an awful lot of information that we need, we can use to build models from. So, you know, technology companies and, and Seek is one of them, uh, Beyond Limits, uh, Ambient, uh, Seven Lakes, there's a number of different companies, you know, probably too many for to mention that are essentially coming in here and they're, uh, they're taking all of this time series data. They're, the first step is to assemble and contextualize that data to, to really kind of assign the tag names that we have from the historian and then assign it to a piece of equipment within the plant. Then we can investigate and we can collaborate with, between uh, you know, different experts and even this idea here of multivariate analysis because we normally don't have one sensor on something. We may have a dozen sensors. And that way, instead of just looking at one time series uh, you know, kind of trend, we'll look at many. And we'll be able to recognize patterns from a half a dozen sensors on different parts of the process. And with this, we can monitor and publish the results. And, and clearly we are working these sort of uh, pl uh, analytics platforms, visualization platforms sitting on, on top of historians or control systems. They're essentially allowing us to recognize things much sooner, much more accurately, and, and that's creating value in terms of allowing our processes to run more efficiently and for longer time periods. Well, you begin to see, you know, visualizations like this. And, you know, clearly we've got data quality problems. We have to work on the, the data conditioning as we go through this. But by doing multiple kind of cycles, we can begin to recognize the good patterns from the not so good patterns. We can recognize the patterns that are precursors to failure and recognize just the trends where we're starting to, you know, kind of vary off, uh, what we expected and what our normal uh, you know, behavior of the pattern is. And we can kind of recognize when we need to intervene. And we're, it, these are different sort of uh, an analytical visualizations that we may normally be used to. But this is kind of you know, uh, very familiar with our operations guys. But now again, OT has a, a, an awful lot of value to add to our remote decision support centers and to our IT environment we just need to learn, you know, some new, new patterns, new visualizations about what we should be looking for. Well, I'm going to finish up this with, uh, you know, some concerns and 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 some some things to watch out for. And you know, these may be a little, um, you know, kind of basic as you look around to it. But first of all, five concerns. Number one, you know, that you you will have some people will say, well, you know, this this idea of cognitive artificial intelligence, essentially that the data is perfect. You just plug in the data, put in these, these models that you built, and and out pops intelligence. Out pops, you know, our our, our perfect idea of what things are going to try to happen. Well, this idea of prediction, which I, I said is something we're really tr working towards. We want to be able to take these models and run the simulations and predict the future. But you know, there's we really need to understand the context of what is happening. We understand the data quality, where it's from building the right models with regard to this. Because, you know, really these are very powerful correlation engines and we can work at, to build correlations that aren't really real, uh, don't really fit the physical constraints, don't fit the his historical performance of the system. And you know, this idea of naively trusting the data and the algorithm in order to, to tell us what to do, we still need an experienced eye. We still need, uh, you know, kind of the, the historical concept, the physical understanding of when these models really are are giving us results that really are, are are wrong and nonsensical. So we really need to try to do that. It isn't all about the statistics. It is really about co combining that with the operational knowledge as well. Well, we think you know again this, these algorithms are such are magic, and with it we can skip a bunch of steps, um, and we can we can skip the idea of feature engineering or or contextualization of the information, the asset frameworks. And no, I mean, it, these are complex workflows and you need to understand all of the steps involved. 
Now, you may be able to do these much faster, but that doesn't mean you can skip the steps uh, that, that you need to in, in terms of, the, of just oversimplifying the kind of problem and over-trusting the analytics and the algorithms that they're going to produce that. So, you know, it's, it, a lot of these AI techniques are very de highly dependent on the idea of labeling. You know, you go back to the, the simple internet one that, you know, if you want the algorithm to be able to dif differentiate between a picture of a cat and a dog, you're going to have to have a whole lot of human beings that were going to label doc, uh, images that this is a cat and this is a dog. And, and, and that helps build, um, you know, build up the intelligence of the model. But without that, you know, the algorithm doesn't know what a cat looks like. It doesn't know what a dog looks like at the very first image that it looks at. So clearly uh, this whole idea still requires an awful lot of human. This time the intervention is in building the model not so much interpreting the results, but we have to build the model right in order to get it, you know, to work for us. Well, and the other part of this naive extrapolation of all this stuff is this magic is just going to replace the need for all human beings because it mimics human intelligence. Well, that is what AI is. It's it, we're trying to get an algorithm or a model to mimic human intelligence, but you know, it, it, it unless your workers are performing some very very simple narrow, repetitive sort of tasks, which should be probably aut automated anyway, then the answer to that is it will replace the role of the humans. But with the complexity of the task we're trying to do today, you know, it, we really need human beings to be involved in this process, certainly building the model. After that, just kind of as oversight in order to make sure the model, what it is predicting makes sense. And also there to catch things that AI just doesn't recognize. We shouldn't let it, you know, kind of work through things it's never seen before. That's when we really need the humans to come back into the process and essentially, you know, label things that maybe we, we haven't defined a pattern before. Well, the, the whole idea of AI can explain why something happened. Up, up until recently, a lot of AI was really just a black box, meaning you fed it a lot of data, you had a, a feedback loop from a lot of outcomes, and essentially you build up a process, it might have been a neural net process, it might have been a random forest, or there's a whole bunch of statistical techniques that you could use to, to build up these models, but it has a hard time explaining why. It can predict, you know, that A, B, C, and D will get F, you know, with, with regard to an awful lot of data through that, but why did it get F? I think that's one of the things that the physics-based experts still have a lot of problems with uh, artificial intelligence, because when you ask, uh, you know, the model, why did you come up with this answer? You know, it doesn't know. I mean, it isn't in the process of understanding the why. It's just an idea of creating the correlations. So this stuff doesn't replace the scientific method for determining causal links. And in an industrial setting, we really need to know why something is breaking so we can fix it. And, or else if we don't, it's going to happen again. Well, with this idea of AI predicting the future, I said, you know, that that is one of our goals. So we are we are constantly trying to do this idea of what is going to try to happen. Well, given uncertainty and given probability, we can operate within a certain range and say that, you know, it's probably going to happen this way. But is it going to uh, do you have guarantees? No, I think in, in, in industrial applications, we do need meaningful predictions. Like, you know, you know, when you have the characteristics of this fan blade, Will it indicate that it may jam? Well, the probability is, you know, the AI can kind of give us that answer, that sort of question for us, but it can't really answer the why, and it can't often answer the, you know, the some of the complexities of how you've changed the model. So clearly today, you know, it's getting better, but, you know, trust but verify with regard to what you're trying to do for all of this. Well, one of the things that... Uh, I think it's becoming important. These analytical capabilities are becoming very, very capable and, and very sophisticated. And you can put interfaces on them where all of a sudden, like natural language processing, that all of a sudden, instead of AI being an algorithm or a tool or some mathematical digital twin, it's actually going to be a coworker. And just like we have natural language processing interfaces with Siri on our smartphones, with Echo on, on smart devices in the home, you know, we, we will be having these, this technology that we will be relating to through augmented reality, virtual reality, natural language processing, 
So we're, we're, we're pretty good at much going to have to get used to this technology add as a co-worker, not as a tool. And that, you know, when we do it too naively, we'll run into those problems we just mentioned. But we run, when we deal with it, uh, you know, and, and, and with trust and verify, with the idea of always working real hard to build a model and have the feedback loops and looking at the exceptions and doing supervised learning of our algorithms as you go through this, then all of a sudden it could become a trusted coworker. Well, why isn't this stuff already as good as is promised? The first problem is the data itself. And, and uh, the problem is with data quality, with our description, uh, often called a taxonomy for structured data. You know, we, we, ha we don't have really have a very good idea of all the data that we're trying to use. So it, it's difficult from the very beginning to then to just take what we have, which is, you know, of questionable quality, sometimes poor quality, and then kind of throw it a model and then, then to kind of build an algorithm with it. If the, if the data quality is bad, we, we really can't trust the quality of the model that we're trying to build. So working with the data and understanding where it comes from and where some of the weaknesses are is one of the first places that we have to start. Some of the algorithm builders, you know, kind of have a, a naive idea of just, well, if the data is out there, just, you know, give it to me and I'll build a model and I want all of the data possible and I'll sort it out. Well, unfortunately, getting access to the data uh, is, is difficult. The, the techniques, the protocols, the formats, the storage mechanism of all of this data have changed over time. And often they differ by some of our discipline or functional silos. And even by vendors, they may take the same pump and call it something different in their catalog. And it's a very similar sort of pump with a different manufacturer, but how do we put the things together unless we've got a very good data catalog? So just assuming access to all of the relevant data is again, one of those things that you just can't trust. You're gonna to have to work hard at that. And again, it's all this upfront effort we're gonna to have to put on the data side of, the, of, of this process. Well, trusting the predictions. We kind of talked about it before. And AI sometimes can get it wrong. And again, without uh, understanding the implications of all of the models that we're trying to build, blindly trusting some of these predictions uh, is gonna get us into a lot of trouble. So AI-aided automation performed in industrials can be truly sensitive, dangerous, or deadly situations. You know, we're dealing with stuff that blows up. So we have to have safety as a as kind of a number one uh, even value as we go through this. And so clearly building these models and just all of a sudden trusting safety sensitive systems on them is probably a leap too far today. So we really need to, to, to worry about all of these different elements and components of these AI driven models and to be able to, to, to know when we can trust them and when we can't. So the recommendations here, don't skip the critical steps of building your data foundation. Data is important. You can't just take anything, put it in one of these algorithms and get the right answer. Unfortunately, sometimes you can get an answer uh, or you can get an answer that seems like it makes sense, but clearly you need to, uh, to work very hard. Uh, and where you call it data foundation, data threads, or whatever it is, data is important. And keep a lookout for specific AI applications that might be adopted from other industries. You know, often we need to go faster to adopt some of these technologies, but we really need to understand the context and the consequences of those applications. Many app use cases can be quite feasible, uh, but in other, the other cases, AI and deep learning is being used to replace simple repetitive human perception tasks, but not the more complex one or the sensitive or dangerous ones. So use AI carefully, use it, but use it carefully in terms of how you try to put, put all this stuff together. Well, my last set of recommendations here, you know, borrowed from experts that I've, uh, I've researched, you know, use the least complicated methods first and use on, you know, data that you trust initially as you go forward and then move up the maturity curve and only understand when there's a, a real business value for it. Don't just use AI for AI sake. You know, the, the people that have the newest technology aren't the ones that win. It's the ones that are making the better decisions towards important business challenges in the operations areas that are gonna win. 
So always take keep your eye on the business driver, your uh, the objective you're trying to get to, the data you're using, how you are building the models, how you are understanding some of these predictions and testing them against operational experience. That's how you really need to uh, to move through this. You know, solve the simplest low hanging fruit problems first. Worry about the value of the applications you're trying to do. And then maybe don't just trust one model. Use a collection or an ensemble of models. Using a variety of techniques, including AI, that work together is really going to be the way that we're going to get the greatest transparency and understanding of not only what is happening, but hopefully a better understanding of what will happen in the future. So we can take advantage of that. Well, I'm going to I finish with just a, a piece of wisdom from Edwards Deming, the quality guru, uh, you know, that, that really helped, you know, set a lot of our industrial business processes into a way where we're doing them much more efficiently. And he said, it's not enough to do your best. You must know what to do and then do your best. Experience, domain knowledge, your skill as a petroleum engineer is still critical, even when you learn how to program even when you learn how to build these digital twin and analytical models. Well, this comes to the end of my, of my videos. I hope you found them enjoyable. Please let me know if you have any questions, but I would thank you for the opportunity uh, to present a little bit about my view of the digital oil field 2.0 um, to all of you. Thank you and I hope you stay safe.